Hello and welcome to the Functional Tennis Podcast with me, your host, Fabio Molle. Every week I speak to the big hitters in the world of tennis, both on and off the court, about the game and how we can all get 1% better every day at what we do. As an ex-national team player, I know exactly how tough this can be. So I'm on a journey to get the very best tips and advice from the world of tennis. Last week on the Functional Tennis Podcast, I spoke to legendary tennis coach and former player Rick Macy. The reaction we got from some of the posts was quite interesting on our Instagram account. If you haven't listened to the chat, it's worth listening to because some very interesting topics in there and some may say topical. But in our conversation, Rick detailed his experience training Venus Williams and Serena Williams when they were kids. Rick also shared the moment he was told they were making the film about the Williams sisters and their father, King Richard, and what he felt like being portrayed on the big screen we also spoke about how players can recover from setbacks rick revealed on the exciting new project he's working on and he also tells us how much a private lesson with him is you should have a listen just for that it was an absolutely fantastic episode so i really do recommend you going back and checking it out this week on the podcast, I meet former Northern Ireland player and now coach Peter Botwell. Peter was the first man from Northern Ireland to have an ATP Tour world ranking in singles or doubles. He played in the Irish Davis Cup team and he also won the Irish Open in 2018. In 2020, Peter formally retired as a player, but that doesn't mean he stopped being involved in tennis. He's now a coach. He is trying to inspire the junior generation in Northern Ireland and he's just become the lead coach for Alston Risk Armitage, who is a top 50 ranked WTA player. So he's an exciting journey ahead of him. In our conversation, Peter tells me about how his journey in tennis began, all the miles he put in between Belfast and Dublin in the car. He also opens up about the decision to retire and why he's always wanted to become a coach. Peter also tells me about his non-negotiables and much more. Before all that, let's hear a bit more about Peter's new coaching role. Pete, welcome to the Functional Tennis Podcast. How are you? Fabio, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm good. Been a hectic week, but I'm good now. Yeah, we're going to touch into that in one sec. I had to, when I messaged you, I was like, Pete, have you been on this podcast before? We've had a few Irish players. It was like, I've talked to you about it and I just 175, 178 episodes, I think now. I can't remember them all as much as I'd like to. Great to have you on and congrats. Time is great. Congrats on your new job. Maybe tell us what the new job is. Yeah, so well, literally flying out to Orlando tomorrow morning and I'm going to be lead coach to Alison Risk. So that's p- partly why we had to had to cancel last week because uh, my life was uh yeah got a little bit hectic so yeah no it's just um it's really fresh really new um just a few conversations happened a couple of weeks ago and yeah talks continued from there and um I'm heading back out on tour congrats that's a that's a big job and you previously did a stint on tour with Pad P- Pana Uvardi, who we had on the podcast as well uh, so you learned what did you learn from working with Pana that you'll take into the next gig? Well, I think the first thing is listen, got to listen more than you speak to start with. You know, that's what that's what I did. First of all, going out with Pana uh, to build up that trust straight away. And I think that's actually why we had success straight off the bat, because she was the one that had complete ownership of her game. Um, and then, you know, she filled me in on that. And then it was my job then to find finer details and to keep her mentally in a good place um to try to sustain her level uh which she at the time she was playing she was playing good um but i think for myself as well that was my first job on the tour i'm not sure at that time whether i backed myself enough whether i was confident enough in in that situation um maybe being my first time where where now it feels different i feel like i'm good enough to to do a job at that level and uh, I'm looking forward to the challenge. Nice. And what is, so you're flying to Miami? Orlando. Or Orlando, sorry. Uh, you're you're flying to Orlando and do you plan, what's the plan? Are you just going to be on the road for X amount of time or do you train and block or what's going on? Yeah, well, so we're going one, one week of training. So seven days in Orlando at the USTA National Campus. And then we're heading off to two two fifty, so one in Mexico and then Austin, uh, and then I actually have to fly home. I actually I'm missing Indian Wells because I got to cover, uh, I got to cover my bro um, for one week, which which they knew about and which was already well he had already planned that. So unfortunately I'm missing Indian Wells, but uh, 
but yeah, that's so then after that, then I'm heading back out for Miami, Charleston, and that's kind of like the hard court swing done. And then, you know, then you're on to the, the clay court swing in Europe and and hopefully further ahead. Funnily, I'm going to Indian Wells. I can take over for that week. <laughs> uh, I'm actually not. I plan to go, but it's not happening now. You still have a job in Northern Ireland. And how, like, that must be extremely hard where you be on the road for so long. You have a load of kids that you work with in there. How are you managing that? Sam and so obviously I coach with my brother Sam and we are the two head coaches. So Sam kind of is head coach for the club program in, in essence, you know, so just the regular club players, juniors and adults. And in theory, then I'm meant to head up the performance planning. So I will still do that from away from base. And then it will just be Sam, uh, Jack and Laszlo, the two other coaches will then just implement. Yeah. What, what I plan, what the plans I put in place and basically just, you know, I've stepped back from on court and then Jack and Laszlo will just up their hours a little bit more uh, and join Sam then on the court. You know, we do most of our hours together. Um, so we overlap, like I do the regular club stuff with him and then Sam hops over and jumps on court with me to do all the tournament players as well. So, you know, it's it's a tight, like, you know, the program is tight. You know, we're lucky to have two indoor courts during the winter months, uh, which makes our life a lot easier. And then we do have access to a couple of other indoor courts that we try to use at times. Um, but it's all just a balance, you know, making sure we we give enough to the regular club players and then we're able to provide enough for those tournament players. And then also that uh, adults and, you know, the, the court spaces there are available for uh, club members as well to use you know it's just a, it's a complete balance and act not ever lots of people are interested in coaching lots of people don't want any coaching you know so it's just a constant battle to make sure you know we get the, the coaching indoors and then the members also get access to those courts as well it's the same in every club with limited indoors and the irish cold weather so it's definitely a tough but i've got carried away here i've gone too far ahead we're going to throw it back to your early days and i'm curious to know where about in northern ireland are you from yeah so grew up in hillsborough a small village in hillsborough and that's where i started playing tennis downshire tennis club and that's funny enough where Sam and I now coach. Um, so we've done a full circle of starting there, moving away and then coming back. So, you know, for us, we both did a little bit of work at, in Dublin and over time, but any opportunity then we got to come back to this club and probably give back, you know, since the club were so good to us, then, you know, it, it, it really feels like home and it's such a nice, you know, we live two minutes away. From the courts and it's just got that nice home feel about it when did you first pick up a racket what was the inspiration to start playing tennis well i mean the inspiration was easy mum and mum my mum and my grandfather were both tennis coaches you know i think from the age of five or six i was playing tennis uh, i think just walking around the court just holding a racket while even they were playing uh just being at the side of the court while they were working probably and and that's just where i got into it but also at the same time they didn't force me to play tennis. They were uh, they were just supportive of me playing lots of sports, you know. So from a young age, it was rugby, football, swimming, badminton. Like I think literally anything, any sport you could score in, Sam and I were playing. When when was the day you decided to get serious? Do you remember that day where you said, "Mom, I'm serious about tennis. I want to be a pro tennis player." If I go back, like when I got more serious, maybe when I was about ten. So I. That was when the National Center was at DCU, when that was kind of kicking off. So we got the opportunity to go train there full time. Um, so we lived on on campus um, at DCU for two years. Um, my mom was actually the house parent uh, for five or six other players as well during that time. Um, and she decided to do that because we were we were so young. So that meant um, that she would she was there with us and. Yeah, kind of at that time, like we were living in Dublin basically for two years. Like dad was working full time Monday to Friday. And then on the week on Friday, he would leave work at lunchtime and then drive down and spend the weekend then with us down in Dublin when those other players kind of went back home um, on the weekend. So that's when it probably got more serious. But to answer the question of being a professional tennis player, I, I never really thought about it. And the reason being... You know, there at the time, like growing up, there was maybe only the Irish Open. Like that was the only one. There was only one professional tournament that you could that you could watch. And most of the tennis, the live tennis that I watched was Davis Cup. So from that young age or being a teenager, all I wanted to do was play Davis Cup because those are the you know they used to be held in Fitzwilliam. 
Um, you know, those are my earliest memories of watching like good competitive tennis in a good atmosphere and, and maybe playing other sports from a young age. I was upset. I, I really enjoyed team sport as well. So I was like, you know, this sport that I love and also in a team environment, I was like, okay, that is, that there is for me. So when I was probably a teenager, what I wanted to do was represent Ireland in Davis Cup. That was my biggest end goal, or that was the driver for me uh, while I was putting all those hours in. Nice. And we'll get up to Davis Cup in a sec. Firstly, who would the other five kids in the house? Nal Fitzgerald. Um, okay. used to spend a couple of days. Okay. Uh, Lindsay McCullough and Emily Medill at times. Um, Tony Rush, who kind of stopped playing tennis 15, 16, but he was under 14s, like top 100, I'm pretty sure, tennis year of ITF. Then you had Rachel Daly. She was from Cork. Sinead Lowen, maybe sometimes on weekends. So there was like, um, yeah, so there was, I think it was like Lindsay, Emily, Niall were pretty like solid there. Um, and then a few others like in and, in and out. I hope I haven't missed anybody. Your mom was like, it was like a foster home. She was taking care of all these kids. And I didn't know Niall was Gerald who lived in Greystone. It's a bit of a trek to be doing. Yeah, I think it was just for him because like at that time, it obviously like the academy was a full-time academy. So maybe... You know, it was just easier for him to stay like two, three nights, um, just stay there instead of having to track really early in the morning and stuff. So, so you did, uh, you're in DCU 10 to 12. I, did you decide what happened then at 12? Did you move back home or were you, what was the plan? What changed? Just, you know what, like maybe it was a little bit too intense too early living away from home. I literally just, I think I, at that time, Sam was a, Sam's obviously two years younger than me. So mum decided to take Sam home and I was then there for a couple of months just by myself. And I think just one day I called dad up and just said, look, I just want to go home. Like I just want a little bit more of a normal life. So I think just at that time, I think the idea was great. You know, what Gary was trying to do was, was good. I just think maybe at that age, I was a little bit too early um, for that step. You know, I just wanted to go to school have a bit of crack in school, like a bit more of a normal routine, a bit more of a normal life. Um, I guess that was quite mature maybe from from me maybe at yeah. that age, but I just thought like it was just maybe too much tennis, like too intense, too early. And I didn't know who you were back then, like as a 10, 11 year old, but we probably came into contact through Macari's where my parents had a takeaway beside, right beside the National Training Centre in DCU. And I'm sure I knew you're older going in there, but back then I'm sure your mom would have snuck in the odd time or you guys would have snuck in the odd time. So that's kind of, that's I mean, funny. McCar- McCarry's was a pretty popular spot, I have to say. What was your biggest challenge? So uh, was it just living away from home? Were you looking back at your junior career? I think just, well, at that time, just living in DCU, like I think it, I think it was being away from home. Like I just, and I just felt like I wanted that normal life. So I, I went back home um went to high went to Dramore High School um still played you know I say okay my tennis dropped back a little bit like I didn't maybe train f- six days a week like I was doing before I maybe did three or four um and then I actually I actually started playing rugby again so I played rugby till I was 16 17 in school you know so I just tried to do the best we, we just tried to do the best that we could at the time and that ended up leading us to driving to Dublin three or four days a week then still in a, about a year later because that's when we started driving down to Malahide um, and working with Stephen and Mike, Mike Nugent and um, so although we were living at home uh, we still ended up trekking to Dublin two three days a week we used to go down Thursday evening after school for a couple of hours then drive back Friday or Saturday we'd drive down maybe stay over if not drive back and then drive back down again for Sunday and it seems a bit mental and but honestly at the time it was like just everything that we wanted to do like i didn't think twice about it you know um and we did that from i think the age of 13 to 16 17 you say okay at the time that was what you know it made sense at the time you enjoyed it and looking back uh, let's you know you can look back in many different ways but how would you advise some other kid who you're working with who as opportunity to train the National Training Centre. I know there's nothing going on there at the minute, but let's say there was. What would be your advice to like a 12-year-old who had the opportunity to train in Dublin and their parents say, let's drive up and down every three or four times a week? What's your advice to them? If it's the player's decision and the and the parents can accommodate that. To, you know, we were training up here and we were doing things with the, the province and we just didn't think. I just came out of training one day and I just said, look, I don't want to do this. Is there any chance that... You know, we can go to Malhide an extra day a week. And mom and dad had a conversation. They were like, yeah, let's do it. You know, so 
even at that age, like Sam and I were taking complete ownership of our tennis. And it was like, if our parents could accommodate that, they did it. And so like looking back, I wouldn't change that because Mick and Stevie were so influential in our tennis, you know, and that's then when I got set up through the academy to go to Spain when I was 17 and stuff. So like everything happens, you know, I'm a believer, everything happens for a reason. You know, so us grind, like us going through, like grinding early to get up and good on and all that kind of stuff, you know, it it was worth it. And you went to Spain. Were you with Dan and Soto at Spain or did that happen later on? Yeah, so that's when, so there was an overlap with Nathan Rooney. So Nathan Rooney spent a bit of time in Dublin and then he was playing on a league team in Malahide. When we were playing league tennis at Malahide, he, yeah, he approached me and just said, look, I'm taking up this role in Spain. I'd be interested in coaching you. So he was the one that approached me about it. And I went back to the dad, had some conversations with him. And he said, well, look, got to get our GCSEs done first. And then we'll evaluate the situation. So then Nathan had maybe done a year or two out in Spain at that time. And, and then after my GCSEs, then that's when I um, that's when I moved out to Soto Tennis Academy in Spain, which is led by Dan Kiernan. So the first couple of years out there, I was coached by Nathan and then Nathan and Dan, a little bit of an overlap. And then over time, then Dan led my program then out there as well. So Nice. Uh, for those that don't know, Nathan Rooney then went on to be an agent and he has his own agency and he's the agent of Dan Evans. I'm, I'm not sure if uh, Jamie Murray as well and I'm, maybe a few others, but uh, that's what he does now, which is great. So your brother, Sam, was it? He's a he was a pro like yourself, a couple of years younger. Did it help having a, a brother who you could spar with every now and again, or did was there some competitive battles on and off the court? Yeah, I mean, well, I'm just gonna put it out there. We had two matches, I, like I think two matches in a tournament, and I have a hundred percent record. So just we'll just we'll just get that out there. And um, but yeah, we, we were really lucky. You know, like you said, the sparring, training together, you know, being able to hit up here. Mum's a coach. You know, when we were kids, our granddad was a coach as well. Mum was probably working more full time. So he would take us a little bit and we would always do sessions together. So, you know, we always, it was, everything was just competitive from the tennis court to the rugby pitch to the football, you know, table tennis, like you name it, like whatever, whatever we played, it was a battle, you know, like started inside and then might, might finish outside because it maybe got too intentional. <laughs> Brothers, yeah. yeah. And d- did he ever get the one over you on any sport? What's his sport that he gets you on? Uh, I mean, football all day, like soccer. Um, unfortunately, I've got one left foot. He's a bit more talented and he could kick a ball with two feet. But yeah, no, that's, I'll give him, I'll give him that one. We have to give him something, give him something. Yeah. And plus he'd, he'd be on the road with you and make life to drive down to Dublin a bit easier. Yeah, I mean, we did, like, yeah, at that time, we did everything together on the league teams together, you know, and then later traveling together, playing doubles together. It was just, you know, some of my fun, fondest memories are playing doubles with him. What age did you decide to to call it quits on the, on the traveling, the playing tennis? Well, yeah, that was 2020, like kind of, um, it was just, it was during COVID. Um, so what's that, three years ago now? So yeah, when I was 20, 24. That's when I decided to give it up. Yeah, I just, 2019 was a really difficult year for me. I um I actually lost 15 singles matches in a row. Uh, So like, you know. And How I, do you deal with that for losing 15? What was it like, like the 9th, the 10th, the 11th? That's 15 tournaments there. Yeah, yeah. It's not it, like it somebody was also, two tournaments. Yeah, it was also worse because I was still making like semis of doubles, final of doubles, like winning a couple of doubles events as well. So it's like, not like I was playing bad, you know, it's not like I was playing badly. I just, I, I, as it goes on, you just start to think about it more, right? And just, it's then, you know, I'm doubting myself, am I training hard enough? So then I train like even harder. And I'm like, but then I get onto the match court and I'm like, I almost then I'm so focused on the outcome because I've trained so hard and I feel like I'm working so hard. But then when I get onto the match court, then I'm forcing it because I'm like, you know, I, I should win this match and I should win this match and I, cause I put in the work when, um, when actually it was almost to like breaking point. So what happened was, yeah, I basically broke down after an event in Spain, like, you know, basically cried, was close to just smashing all my rackets, was going to call mum and say, right, I'm done. I'm never playing. I'm never playing again. I can't do it. I just felt like I couldn't handle, I just couldn't handle that, that, 
environment that battle anymore and just because it didn't make sense to me so what happened was i came back and then i actually looked during that time like dan was unbelievable to me like providing so much support and but it's just something that i felt like i needed to figure out myself like or that time and he told me to take a bit of time away go back home so i brought on a i brought on what i would call like a life coach yeah like not really a psychologist someone just to sit down with pete and discuss life tennis and and everything like that so and it was the first time kind of in my career that i opened up right my personality is very much like a workhorse like do things by myself and i would have found it i would have seen it as a sign of weakness to ask for help right like and that was i remember being like that in school if there's a question in maths that i couldn't figure out i wouldn't ask the teacher yeah. i would just grind away and try figure it out by myself and then when i when I could nail it, then I'm like, yeah, I got it. Right. And this was like the first time where I kind of like sat down one to one with someone, you know, off a tennis court and just chatted. And yeah, then I just basically from that, I started to figure out more about myself, understanding that, you know, problem shared is a problem halved. And just it gave me an opportunity to get this weight off my shoulder. Because I guess the more those matches went on, the expectation got higher in my head. And I just, I created a massive deal about nothing really, right? And yeah, I I then got into a little bit of visualization, you know, some men, you know, some mental like coping mechanisms, and and um, from the start of twenty twenty, then I um, yeah, I put those or sorry, well after maybe February twenty twenty, then I put those into practice, and funny enough. The first match I then won went seven. I won at seven six in the third, oh, and I was five two down in the tie break in the third set, and just kind of like a little bit to do with the visualization, but also with my preparation, me being better to myself, me being kinder to myself. In that situation, I was just like, "It's fine, I got this," and I just won the next five points in a row. And I didn't even. And the thing that I liked most about that moment was like, I didn't like over celebrate like obviously I'm in my head I probably built it up so long yeah you know I just that was the job done that was the job done for that day go rest recover let's see if I can repeat it then the next the following day you know so then actually because I think I always prided myself on uh my effort levels you know so like I had a pretty good uh record third set six all in the third like I have a winning percentage and uh, third set tie breaks all that kind of stuff and um, and I just gone away from that and just lost that. I just lost that belief in myself. So bringing, in, you know, having a couple of other people on board that maybe know a little bit less about tennis, but can just talk to you from a different capacity. And, you know, then obviously I saw the benefit from that. So it was actually really difficult because then at that time, a couple of weeks later, then that's when COVID hit. And obviously from being like, in the worst place mentally like i mean like uh, you know questioning whether i was actually depressed and what whether there was something wrong with me to then going i'm ready to go again i've cracked it you know i feel good let's go and then covid hit came home no one knew what was happening and gin and then because of that period then i just sat back and reflected now if i go back to something that i said at the start of the pod was at, when i was a junior all i saw was davis cup right and all i wanted to do was play davis cup I didn't really know much about the pro game. There had never been any professional tennis player from Northern Ireland before. And I kind of sat back and reflected on, like, if you had asked Pete at 14, 15, that he's going to be 600 in the world, win an Irish Open, win X amount of doubles titles, play Davis Cup, all that kind of stuff, would I have taken that? Yeah, 100%, yeah. That was probably the main driver um, for my decision. And I think what made the decision easier was I knew what I wanted to do post playing like I knew it's I knew at 17 18 that I wanted to be a tennis coach right and that's how I made you know that's how I made things work when I was out in the academy in Spain that I would help offset some costs by coaching and hitting with players and trying to be a role model for these players for the younger players in the academy I think the decision was then made easy because it was like right my next challenge is going to be a coach and that's then what I, I knew I wanted to go into that so that's why my decision probably then was a bit easier Nice. You were learning on the go, really. You knew. It. Do, do you think that's an advantage or disadvantage? Knowing, okay, well, plan B here is once this ends, I'm going to be a tennis coach and I'm setting up for that. 
that probably in the lo- in looking back probably helps speed things up to where you are now only a few years later where you've moved quickly if you were still out there grinding who know you know you could be still stuck and fight we've all seen many players who get to i don't know f- six seven four five six seven hundred and they last there for four they never improve you know they get there young and they don't move injuries and whatnot so i think look i think looking back you made a good decision it would i hope you agree with that yeah i think i uh, i do i mean there's there's definitely times like and people have told me oh you should have kept playing you could have done this like doubles blah, blah, blah. but i'm like it's fine i'm completely happy with my decision I knew, and I think it's easier because I think players sometimes get lost. You know, some players keep just keep playing because they know they can maintain their ranking, but they're not sure what they want to do next. So, so they just keep playing for the for the sake of it. Where I, where I knew it was a simple decision. I knew what I knew what I my next goal was going to be, and um, that probably, like you said, just meant the process was a little bit quicker. I think there's a lot we can learn from Peter's outlook here. Sometimes in life, it's more difficult to stop than to continue going. Peter probably could have continued playing, but he has so much to offer tennis as a coach. And if in his mind, he knew that's where his heart was, then becoming a coach full-time was definitely the right decision for him. This is just a quick reminder, you're listening to Functional Tennis, the podcast that helps you get 1% better every day. With me, Fabio Molle. Coming up on the podcast, I ask Peter what his end goal as a coach is. We also go through some non-negotiables he has for his players and himself. And Peter outlines the clever way he and his team keep their juniors motivated on a weekly basis. But first, I wanted to ask Peter about representing Ireland in the Davis Cup. Let's hit Davis Cup here. Two things. One, were you like, you wanted to play Davis Cup, but did you have other tennis goals? Were you heavily goal driven? And two, what was it like the first match you played? For Ireland, yeah, well, I think just like I said, because you know there hadn't been a guy from Ulster play Davis Cup in like forty two years. Like you know, my dad's just tell me all these facts, you know, and they just stick with it. And then there hadn't been, you know, there'd never been a guy from Northern Ireland ever hold a ATP ranking before. I know there's been good good players over the years with Connor McGee, Sam, and but it's it's just slightly different. Like you know, they're in Dublin. I don't see those guys that much. Like being from the north, it's like no one had done this before. Um, so that's why like Davis Cup was probably like the first goal. And when I got an A to be ranking, then, you know, then the goal was, well, how high can I go? That was kind of just what what happened, you know, the way I went about it. Um, Where was your first point? In um, Frinton on the grass in the UK. I remember it. three sets over Bruce Strachan, 6-3 in the third. 40 love up, lost the next two points because I was tight, like trying to protect the lead. And then I was so tight that... I just, I said serve and volley. So I served and volleyed and yeah, won the point. So there we go. And uh, and it was nice because I I actually was at that tournament by myself and Dan was actually in England at the time. So Dan and Jimmy were over for a grade four junior ITF and they surprised me that morning after I qualified. They drove down that morning, or sorry, the next day, that morning to come and watch me play. It was a nice one. No matter who you ask, whether they're going to be like a top player, Roger Federer, or if you only ever get one point, it's such a big, it's such a big moment for any tennis player to get that yeah. first point because who knows where where that can lead to. And sure. okay, so first time on the court with represent Ireland Davis Cup, what were the emotions like? Nervous levels? <laughs> like where was it? So it was in it was in Estonia. I think it was Group Three and. I cannot tell you how nervous, like how nervous I was. I don't think you can. Even, I, I don't know if you can prepare for it. That's how nervous. Like literally, I think the first, like the first point of the match, like me serving, I'm literally telling myself, just set the ball up high enough and get your feet off the ground. And now, I, I, okay, got through the first game, and then I settled in. You know, group three, there's a few weaker countries, so you can play your way in a little bit. And it's not, you're not worried about a guy being 250 down the far side or something like that. So as the week went on, I got more comfortable and played my way in. And, and we came up short then against Cyprus um, in the in a playoff match to get promoted. But yeah, no, that first match, it's just, yeah, just the build up, like being in a team, you know, I was playing second singles, so they go out first. Like I'm almost hoping first singles is playing first so i could just watch sam barry at least play and yeah. just be like right okay it's, it's not that big a deal it's just another tennis match where it's just like you know you're going out we're playing i think it was albania day one and it's just like we expect to beat them get the job done okay who's the captain 
Connor was yeah. So Connor Nylon was my captain okay. um, throughout all my all my Davis Cup. Yeah, it was great learning. Like you know, just having Connor on the bench, his experience as a, as a player as well is was huge, and it probably good for me. Like he's pretty chilled, like pretty calm on the side of the court, where I'm obviously pretty energized. So I think you know that first occasion, him just being nice and calm, probably. What's he say? What's he saying to you? Like you're a nervous wreck, and before the match, how, how do you? Let's everybody reacts to nerves differently. Before a match, like how? What are your nervous ticks? Like are you? peeing all the time or you eating or yeah yeah bathroom same like same spot always same spot in the locker room uh if, if possible but i think and then i warm up like again and again and again but i think with with connor it was he obviously knew like he knew like you know i didn't have to tell him i was nervous like he could just tell but he was just reassuring me that my level was good enough that i i, I deserved to be here you know and then that just once you got once I got settled through that first game, then you know, then then it was then it was much better. But yeah, I think it was just like it's just literally that first point, you know. And those emotions like still stay with you, like at different times, trying to win a different match, being down in a different match, or being in a way like away. Like that's one thing that unfortunately just we I never got a home tie. I never had one home tie. Okay. So that's, that's just something the the first well. I had won, but I didn't play. So the first time I was part of the team was when we played um, Egypt in Castlenock. Uh, but I was just the fifth man on the team then. Um, but yeah, since then, just the way the draws worked out, just never had a home tie. I don't think there's even been a home tie here for years now. I can't remember. I think literally the last home tie was when I first got picked as fifth man. And that's that's way like way back. Um, yeah. And there's not there's not been a... A home Davis Cup match since, you know. I, I can't remember what, like, it's honestly been a long, long time, which is crazy. So, look, Pete, looking back at your tennis career, you were the first Northern Irish man to get a, an ATP to a point. You won the Irish Open. You represent Ireland multiple times. You know, you got to experience a lot. So, I think kudos to you. You had a great career and uh, and you're still young. You know, you did that at a young age, 23, 24. You're, you've achieved a lot and moving on to the next stage. So, uh you talk about you knew you wanted to be a coach and what are your coaching like when you start taking up coaching what was the coaching dream like what look and what would be your end goal as a coach i mean my my end goal is to influence irish tennis that is 100 percent set on that in which capacity I, I i don't know that'll that'll play itself out um over time but I wasn't sure. I, I mean, obviously I wanted to coach, but at the time I wasn't sure if that wanted to be like, I wanted to just go solely on tour and tour and tour and be a tour coach for 25 years or something. I think I, I want that. Like that's where I'm at now and that's why I've taken this job. Um, but down the line, further down the line, it is how can I influence Irish tennis? And maybe that's even like more specifically to tennis in Northern Ireland. Nice. It, it it takes so much time, though, doesn't it? You know, let's say Ireland doesn't have many players in general right now. And if you look, like you're not going to change a 15, 16 year old. It's too late already unless they're making waves, I believe. So you're looking at the 10, 12 year olds and it's a 10 year plan, really, isn't it? To to get any form of success. So, yeah, you're in it for the long haul. and You want to be really dedicated like you are. Yeah. And it's. I mean, it is really interesting because when you start coaching, it's I think the best bit of advice I got was like coach everybody all levels don't just like if you know if you want to go in and work with tournament players but just don't go into that straight away so you know my first two years did everything i still do everything now like i still take a morning doubles class i still take a tennis fit class and like you said it's i think it's the longer development that excites me as well so over the past year i've done so much with red orange and green ball Maybe when I first started coaching, I didn't think that was going to happen or it wasn't, I think it was too hard to know, but like, I thought maybe I was just going to go into like 14, 16, 18, like influence there because that's like, you know, closer, getting closer to the professional game. That's what I know. And I'm like, well, like you said, it's maybe too late for me to have such a big influence on someone's tennis then where if I get a whole, if I, yeah, if we can influence their player, that player at seven, eight, nine. Maybe that's going to set them up to be in a better position at fourteen, fifteen. The goal is not to create lots of professional tennis players. It's for these players to then use, you know, use their tennis throughout their life. So whether that's 
um, mm-hmm. being able to play that, you know, having a job and you're, you've got a day out to Queens club or something and you can use your tennis or going on a playing tennis in university in the UK, in Ireland, going to college tennis. And maybe a few then try go play on the pro game. Like that's, I think tennis is a great opportunity to use a vehicle in life. And it's like these skills that you're going to learn um, from those young ages to then bring into your own life and your own working career, then post junior career, you know, then those are the biggest, those are the biggest lessons you can learn. And, and I think just being able to play an influential role uh, on those juniors and those young people, like that's what excites me most. Where do you every day, like, how do you get better every day? Where do you look for inspiration? Who do you learn from? How does Pete become a better coach? Yeah, well, I think a good point is that I'm far from the finished article. And I think for me as well, as soon as my playing career stopped, it was like I had the mindset that I knew nothing because I didn't want to make 10 tennis players the same as Pete Bothwell. Like, I'm going to be coaching 10 people that are all individuals. Like, they're different. They've got different personalities. So it's like, how can I communicate with someone that's more of an introvert or how can I communicate with someone that's more of an extrovert? Like, all these things. And there recently I was just doing a 10-week online course with Simon Wheatley learning from 10 world famous coaches you know and it's like might be stuff that you hear you've heard once before but it might be a fresh reminder so it's always just those looking looking out for those I think learning opportunities through tennis but then also I enjoy I enjoy listening to podcasts as well you know I'm a big fan of the high performance podcast and obviously big fan of the functional tennis podcast get out of here (laughs) but yeah I mean you know what like it used to be when I first worked, I, I was working in Sutton and in Dublin, right? And, you know, I used to drive down on a Thursday, back that Thursday night, drive down, then Friday afternoon, work Friday afternoon, all day Saturday, then drive home. And how did I fill the time in the car? Listening to podcasts, you know, listening to Control the Control podcast, your podcast, others. Like, it doesn't have to be tennis related. It's just trying to, like, I'm a big rugby fan, so it's like, some of the best podcasts I've listened to are like World Cup winning coaches and just trying to gain knowledge all the time. Um, and on the wall there, I have like a list of non-negotiables. So I have like a list of, I'm just checking. Yeah, there's like five or six on there that I try. Because for me, it's like I try to hold the players accountable to their highest standards. And if I'm not doing that myself, well, then... Uh, you know I, how can i challenge a player can you can you share with us your non-negotiables or well a cup, like a cup you know like some are really simple so it's like making sure like honestly making sure my room's tidy the bed's made one really important one for me is that i get time away from the sport so it's like i try to go to the gym twice a week i actually go to i try to go to the driving range like i'm big into my golf now so you know i was trying to play golf once a week so get making sure i get the balance right and then there's a few others that maybe just don't want don't want to share as much but but yeah just that, that i'm open to learning so one of them up there is i'm open to learning um asking for advice is a par not a weakness um those are another two that are there so it's just and and then being open to being open to conversation and just being like learning like i want to learn like that's why i signed up the, those courses you know you had Carl Mize, Liam Smith uh battles called beecher all these guys that have been around for years like there's i you can pick something up if you just pick one thing up from listening to one one podcast it's been worth your time you know or mm-hmm. listening to a, a, a coach a, at a presentation like whatever that is one or two things every time you're going to get better look that's why we have you on the podcast there because we're hoping our listeners you know can take one thing away from listening to you based on your experience so uh, and i definitely think there's a few things here they could take away so uh, thanks so far. But uh, you talk about accountability. How do you make your players accountable? So there's you. You have your NGOs. How do you say to your players, look, I need you to rise to these standards. These are your standards. How do you help them maintain it? And how do you enforce it as well? Not in a ba- not in a force like dictatorship, but how do you make sure they're following them? You know, for us, like we let's say like let's use the group that are 15, 16, 17. They all they know themselves of their standards, right? So let's say when we first started like taking this group, Sam and I probably set in what we expect to be the standard, right? And, but it's their responsibility to hold themselves accountable. So we have 
we have a player of the week award. So basically there's a prize at the end of each term, there's a prize for this group for the top two. So the player that finishes sec- first with most points in second, right? And how it works is Sam and I have a vote, but also each player has a vote. So at the end of the training weekend, I then ask them for their player of the week vote. Okay. Now it's not a full, it's not a full week. We don't have that opportunity, but the training sessions that everybody's together, they then vote. And and I ask them to give me a reason as well, because if they're, if they are all pushing each other to train better, the environment's going to be good, you know, and the standards are going to be high. So it's like Sam and I maybe have to remind them from time to time, but they're the ones like if someone's having a bad session, well, they're not, he's not going to get a vote this weekend. Or if she's having a really good session and she's set, like, you know, good example, like a, a good example is like we now have in, in place, we say that you got to turn up 10 minutes, like being on time is 10 minutes before the session starts. Okay. And, you know, if, if there's a good reason that you can't be there before that time, then you text me, like you don't turn up just like after that time or when the session started, because that's, that's not acceptable. It's like, you let me know, right? And then within those 10 minutes, the warm up, your warm up, which is we leave it independently to the players. They can physically warm up whatever way they like because everybody's got their own different routines. The, the warm up then has to match match intensity. So let's say the session starts at seven. So by the time seven o'clock hits, balls go out and everybody's ready. It's not like 702, people are still using their bands or still running about. It's like session started because the end of the day, like we don't have that much t- access to indoor courts. They don't get that many opportunities to train with work or, or sorry, with school and just live. All those minutes add up in a few extra balls with a good focus, you know, that adds up over time. So, you know, that's a, like, that's a little bit of like our, our idea and how we, how we plan things. And that was brought in. Yeah. That was brought in. The player of the week was brought in the previous term and it's been great. You know, like there is one example where. One of the boys maybe had a tough result in a tournament and being honest, he didn't want to turn up to training on Saturday. He told me that. And I was like, that's fine. Don't go. Because, you know, what's the point? You bring that attitude to training. No one's going to want to hit with you and you're going to bring the vibe down. And then like light bulb went off in his head. He's the boy that's like top of the leaderboard. He's going, no, no, no. Okay. I'm not having them win player of the week this week. And, you know, in that moment, that was just his motivation, whether it was the right thing or the wrong thing, but that's what got him to drive and and strive in that moment. So, yeah, so there's loads of different ways to look at it, but I think the players are the ones that are holding themselves accountable. Well, I think, yeah, you give them the, you give them the mechanisms to make themselves accountable and they followed. And then I'm sure they're all competitive players to reach where they are already. So then it's like, they don't want to be losing and they don't want to get, so it, it just makes a lot of sense. So it's a good idea. And it's a good idea that you've a bit of voting in it and the players have voted, you know, they're, it's peer vote, which yeah, it's interesting because people, you know, it will raise the, the bar. The average will be higher. Just finish up on coaching patience. How important it is to have patience as a coach with your players and in general yeah massive i mean i guess it it's all down to well what what you value so it's like you for me i put a greater emphasis on process driven goals and i believe then that leads to outcome driven goals i I think they go hand in hand right like if the process goals are are let's say being ticked but like no outcome goals are being reached like like some there's something's going wrong but i think if you take care of those process goals and the outcome hopefully then gets taken care of itself. But yeah, for, for patients, I mean, again, every player is different. You know, some players might pick up new skills, habits quicker than others. Also players develop, you know, I'm seeing that players develop at different times. You know, there's, and I think for me, I think biggest is patience with younger kids. So it's like, there's a couple like, you know, there, I could, there could be like a really good little Red Bull player. And he's winning a lot at the moment, but maybe there's another player in the group that I feel like is doing things better and trying to do things like completely like to what we're asking, Mm -hmm. but maybe he's coming up a little bit short. Well, if the player, if the parents then also have the patience with, with the kid and the, and the coach, like everybody's on the same wavelength, then hopefully that's going to be better for him down the line. So I think patience for the younger kids is, is huge. Like, 
one of the girls there at the plan at the weekend like this girl's nine she's like so unique like we're trying to develop her game women like women's game already like she, she you know she's obsessed with the sport she understands the game like mentally and tactically like i think so ahead of like other players her age but there's maybe like a two a few technical things that she struggles with and probably can't like just put it all together right now so she she wins and loses but i think like down the line that's going to be huge for her like when she when when that it just clicks and she can like construct it and put it all together i think she's going to have a massive exam like advantage then so you know i think patience with results at a young age like in the colored balls and under tw- like 10s and 12s and stuff like i think it's the outcome is not the most important thing. You know, it's the development of the player then. And look, I think if you're doing the right things, you can still achieve good results at that age, but then it's the results then later in time. At Functional Tennis, we're big about improvement, being 1% better every day. What's your advice to players, coaches, and people to try and be 1% better every day? Just com- taking complete ownership in, in, in what you do. And I think just making sure that you put the person first, like you do things for your, for yourself, like not, not in a, I don't want that to seem like in a selfish, in a, in a cocky way, but it's like, you've got to put yourself first. So is it the right thing for you for like, whether that's that job, whether it's play training in that environment, you know, you've got to put yourself first and not be afraid then of potentially upsetting one or two others. Great. Great. And finally so yeah you're going off now you're going away this will go live you'll be in the middle of your if you'll be a few weeks in on the job what's the expectations of working with allison are you scared a little you know are you are you scared a little bit i mean last week last week was i felt a bit stressful um, because i was still working full-time at home while trying to have communication with her and you know getting everything set up for me to go away i think i'm nervous but that's if you're not nervous you're not ready you're not excited by the challenge so yeah there there's some nerves there but i i'm i'm excited for for this opportunity so look i mean it's 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 new we've spoken on facetime we've never met yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be a cool experience and yeah look we're going straight you know i've said like i said we got a week's practice and then we're going straight into competition so it's not gonna be anything crazy just going to see, can we get her confidence up, get her in a good place, ready to hit the match court and and then take it from there and then see how we go. Nice. Yeah, right answer there because that is where, you know, that's where growth is outside the comfort zone and you got to be a bit nervous in that. So had you said you weren't nervous at all and uh, I would have been like, oh, I don't know. But no, uh, that's where, you know, pushing yourself, challenge yourself. It's a hard thing to do, but that's where the growth is. But Pete, thank you very much. And yeah, looking forward to following this journey. I'm definitely going to be invested in your journey here. No, thank you. Thanks for having me on. It was a good chat. That's the end of the show for today. Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing your time to have a chat today. I'm really excited to see what you accomplish in the future and how you influence the Irish tennis game going forward. We really need you. And thank you all at home for listening to the show. Next week on the podcast, I speak to coach and strength and condition trainer, Johnny Parks. Johnny is a very talented coach. He's worked for IMG, the USTA, and now he's back at the USTA in the West Coast. But he tells us all about how he got into coaching, how he was destined to coach, challenges he had along the way, and how he's always surrounded himself by people he knows he can learn from. And that's helped him elevate himself as a coach. He also tells us about watching Andy Murray as a young kid competing, how Andy played above his age group and how he taught Andy was always destined for greatness. Really great episode with Johnny. It's a must listen for you. Catch you next week. Just a few quick notes before we go. Make sure to follow the show so you get automatically notified about new episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. If you would like to learn more about me or the work we do at Functional Tennis, visit our website at functionaltennis.com. You can also follow the show on Instagram at the Functional Tennis Podcast and with me on Twitter, Fab Mall. This podcast is produced by One Fine Play. James Bishop is the executive producer. Connor Foley is the series producer. I've been your host, Fabio Molle. Thanks for listening to the Functional Tennis Podcast.